Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Jim Tokus, National President of the Canadian Council of the Blind, and Jennifer Jones, President and CEO of Fighting Blindness Canada, welcome to the almost 640 people online and over 55 people in person and by Zoom and are attending this joint White Cane Week 2024 conference. Special thanks to those who attend in person and have traveled here. I would like to recognize the presence of Dr. Martin Sapiro, uh, Spiro, President and of the Canadian Association of Optometrists. Martin, would you stand up, please? <laughs> and Francois Couillard, CEO of the Canadian Association of Optometrists. And at some point this morning, I expect Elizabeth Fowler, the Executive Director and CEO of the Canadian Ophthalmology Society. I would also like to introduce the CCB National President, Jim Tokus. Mr. Tokus, would you stand, please? <laughs> With Jim are members of the CCB Board of Directors, First Vice President from Montreal, Leo Bissonnette. and board member Leslie Yi. <laughs> Thanking our sponsors, I would like the opportunity to thank our presenting sponsors. And building public awareness is important to the Vision Health community. And we couldn't hold important events like today's conference without your support. So thank you to AbbVie, AMI, Apellis, Bosch and Lom, Bayer, Beacon Therapeutics, Biogen, Janssen and Jans Janssen, Johnson and Johnson, McNamara, Mirage GTX, Novartis, Roche, Specsavers, and Via Rail Canada. Thank you. Those gathered here with us recognize that our work here today takes place on the unceded and traditional and current territories of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe nations. The Canadian Council of the Blind and Fighting Blindness Canada honor all First Nations, Inuit and Meti peoples. We acknowledge their valuable past, contributions to this land and their culture and present have nurtured and continue to nurture. We are committed to the renewed nation-to-nation -nation relationship with Indigenous people across the whole of Canada, Turtle Island, based on recognition of rights, respect, cooperation, and partnership. Thank you, Megwich. February is recognized as Age-Related Macular Degeneration, AMD Awareness Month. And today, this morning's session, we will provide an overview of this life-altering disease. In the afternoon session, with the help of key players at Statistics Canada, we will get the first look at the key results of the 2022 Canadian Survey on Disability, including new results and findings for those living with seeing disabilities. For the last 15 years, Morgan Ineson has worked in the disability field promoting accessibility and inclusion. In her current position as Manager at Education at Fighting Blindness Canada, Morgan is dedicated to designing and implementing educational programs that are meaningful and fully accessible. With that, let's give a warm welcome to this morning's session's moderator, ladies and gentlemen, Fighting Blindness Canada's very own Morgan Ineson. Thanks, Mike. Uh, welcome again, and thank you so much to everyone um, for being here today, both in the room and uh, to our record-breaking number of participants online. Uh, we're very excited to have you here. Um, as Mike said, my name is Morgan Ineson. I'm the Manager of Education at Fighting Blindness Canada. Uh, on behalf of my colleagues at FBC, we're so excited to be partnering today with our friends at the Canadian Council of the Blind uh, to be here for this White Cane Conference. Uh, we have the privilege of presenting our first session today, which is all about age-related macular degeneration. 
Uh, Fighting Blindness Canada is not only the largest charitable funder uh, of vision research in Canada, but we're also a leader in providing the most up-to-date and accurate eye health information for Canadians, helping them become their best advocates for their own eye health. So as Mike said, February is AMD Awareness Month, and we have a really insightful program for you today. I hope that you're going to enjoy uh, where we're talking about not just the medical side of things, but also the lived experience uh, of AMD. So uh, let's see, what do I need to tell you before we start? Um, for, um, oh, actually on the screen, we have a program. So you can uh, scan that QR code if you like, and you can access our program online. Uh, we also have going to have a question and answer period at the very end. So at any point um, for our online guests, you can send us your questions in one of two ways. Uh, one is to click the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen, type your question in and press send, or you can email us directly at education at fightingblindness.ca. So for our first part of our program, I'm going to introduce uh, our friend, Dr. Bernard Hurley, who's gonna come up and give a quick presentation about what is AMD, give us the high level overview, and then we're gonna have a panel of people who are living with the condition. And then Dr. Hurley is gonna come back and we're gonna answer questions both in the room and from online. So I will, let's just get right to it. We have a, a full program today. So I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Hurley. He is a vitroretinal surgeon with the Ottawa Hospital and assistant professor at the University of Ottawa Eye Institute, whereas he, he is also the residency program director and fellowship program director. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Hurley. Thanks so much, uh, Morgan, and it's really an honor to uh, be part of a conference that has, I believe, 700 people now uh, intending if we count all the people online. So a big congratulations to the organizers for, um, you know, promoting and, and putting together uh, such an event to attract so many uh, people. Um, so we'll bring up my slides, good. And so I've been asked to provide a bit of an update for uh, 2024 on macular degeneration. So over about the next half hour or so, I wanna really cover some of the background for macular degeneration, the pathology, so how the disease uh, presents itself, um, the individuals that are affected, the demographics. We'll talk about how the disease presents and some of the diagnostic testing that we use. And then we'll put in perspective our treatment, talking about some of the historical treatments and our current treatment regime, talk about some of the unmet needs in this treatment, and then look towards the future with some thoughts on uh, future uh, therapy. So macular degeneration, it has several names, AMD, ARMD, uniform dystrophy, it has a bunch of names. So basically, we're talking about the most common cause of blindness in Canada today. So macular degeneration is the leading cause of blindness, severe central vision loss. And of course, with our population always growing and aging, this is becoming a more and more uh, prevalent uh, condition within Canada. So we say in Canada, if you're old and blind, uh, the most common cause is macular degeneration. And for young people, it's actually a diabetes, but overwhelmingly the biggest cause of blindness today. It affects the center of the back of the eye. So there's an image that shows the optic nerve and the blood vessels that supply the retina. And right at the very center of that image is the macula. And that's where the light that comes into the eye is focused. And the macula give us, gives us our ability to read, to see faces, to do all the things that require fine visual acuity. We can uh, break the macula down um, by looking at a high resolution microscopic image of it. And there's very important cells that we find. There's the rods and cones that are the actual light sensitive cells that um, interpret the light that's coming into the eye. Underneath them, there's a very important layer called the retinal pigment epithelium. And it separates the retina from the highly vascular choroid, which is underneath it and also provides very important nutrition um, to the retina. But this this very vascular structure is always waiting for a break in um, the retinal pigment epithelium to come and grow and cause abnormal blood vessels to form in and under the retina, which is the hallmark of wet macular degeneration that we'll get to in a few minutes. The basic lesion in macular degeneration is the Druse, or we always see more than one, so Drusen. 
So I tell people, drusen in the back of your eye, it's sort of like getting gray or white hair. So we acquire these as we age, and they concentrate in the most important part of the retina, in the macula. If you look at them under a microscope, they're uh, little phospholipid uh, vesicles that are electron uh, dense, and they show up at these white, gray white spots at the back of the eye. And it's the first sign of macular degeneration. Now we, we talk about drusen in different ways. We talk about hard and soft. This is an example here of soft drusen. Soft drusen are more associated with vision loss than hard drusen. And soft drusen, it's hard to sort of tell where one stops and where the next one begins. They sort of blend together in the back of the eye. Uh, whereas hard drusen, as shown here, are more discrete, finite, and you can sort of count them. They tend to be smaller, and they're very common uh, in people above the age of 55, and they're much safer. Drusen can also be defined by their size, small, medium, and large. And again, the larger they get, the more likely to, there to be these soft type with the indiscreet borders that are more associated with vision loss with time. You can also have a pigment epithelial detachment as a manifestation of macular degeneration. I think of this as basically a lot of soft drusen getting together to give a larger bump near the center of the macula. And it's on that spectrum going from dry to wet macular degeneration, sort of the in-between phase almost. There's also pigmentary changes that accompany the first um, signs of macular degeneration. So we start to get clumping of some pigment at the back of the eye associated with this drusen. And it's usually a darker, sort of blacker pigment. And you can see some examples of it on the slide. And the more pigment clumping you have, it's also a prognostic indicator for potential future vision loss. So the hallmark of talking about macular degeneration is always the discussion about dry macular degeneration and wet macular degeneration. Dry macular degeneration, by far the most common form of macular degeneration, and basically 10% of the population over the age of 55 will have these dry macular degenerative changes. So I always remember the rule of 10. 10% 10 of our population over the age of 55, but 90% of that is dry. Only 10% of that is wet macular degeneration, but yet 90% of people with severe vision loss have wet macular degeneration. So 10% of our population, but only 10% of that have the wet form. That's about 1% over the age of 55. So if you think of it in that terms, you now understand how common and prevalent this disease is and why there is such a burden right now on the healthcare system to try to provide accurate care or timely care for this condition. So the dry macular degeneration, we see it as these, these drusen, these deposits, the pigmentary changes we talked about. And in its more severe form, we start to see a lot of pigmentary loss. And we call this geographic atrophy because the way that the pigment is lost at the back of the eye reminds people of a map. So it often looks like a map of Australia or Europe. So we think of it as geographic atrophy. And that's the way that people with dry macular degeneration lose vision. Vision. So as the cells coalesce and become these areas of atrophy larger and larger at the back of the eye, that's where people really start to lose vision due to dry macular degeneration. In the wet type, we look in the eye and we see blood, of course, the hallmark of wet macular degeneration. We see fluid or thickening, and as our body absorbs the fluid, it leaves behind the cholesterol that comes out with it. So we see these uh, fat or hard deposits, lipid deposits, which are basically cholesterol uh, in the retina as well. And the end stage of wet macular degeneration is the discoform scar. So a round, circular, thick, uh, fibrinous scar that forms at the end of the wet stage of macular degeneration. It's really our mission right now as, as ophthalmologists to inject macular degeneration to prevent this and hopefully never see this again in Canada because we have such great treatments now for wet macular degeneration. But this scar that forms is the end of the progression of wet macular degeneration. 
it, it, it's interesting because it doesn't spread then beyond the macula. So it never completely robs somebody of all of their vision, but it takes away all of their macular vision, their fine visual acuity. So again, the rule of tens, 10% 10 of macular degeneration, um, vision loss is due to dry macular degeneration, geographic atrophy, and 90% due to the wet form of the disease. How do we tell the difference between wet and dry? Well, we have, um, it's very important, first of all, obviously for treatment selection, for the rapidity of getting a person in to our, our practices to initiate a therapy. And um, it's, it's important to let the patient know how their condition is expected to progress. Traditionally, we use something called fluorescein angiography to tell wet from dry. It's basically a way of taking some fancy pictures of the back of the eye and developing these pictures on a digital camera. And it shows us a very detailed um, representation of the blood flow at the back of the human eye. So here's a representative fluorescein angiogram. We do it by injecting some dye into the patient's arm. The dye then goes from the venous system to the heart, it's pumped through the lungs, it comes back to the heart, and then it's eventually pumped up to the eye, a process that takes about eight to 15 seconds. And once it gets to the eye, we then record this series of high resolution photographs, so it's showing the blood. First of all, we can see it entering along the arteries. It's actually a green dye, but we always take black and white photos so it, it looks white in color. And then it, it exits along the veins in the back of the eye and fades. And it gives us high detailed, beautiful representation of the vascular circulation and where blood is flowing at the back of the eye. And here's a normal fluorescein angiogram. And here's a fluorescein angiogram of a patient with dry macular degeneration. So the druse and the pigmentary changes, none of those are associated with abnormal blood flow. So we don't see any bright abnormal blood um, flow in dry macular degeneration. Contrast that to wet macular degeneration, which is um, characterized by that abnormal proliferation of blood vessels in the macula, and it lights up really like a Christmas tree, boom, right there for you on the fluorescein angiogram. And this is the you know, gold standard for determining wet from dry macular degeneration. You can define it in terms of classic or occult terms that we don't really use much anymore. It's very important in the old days of photodynamic therapy, uh, but today we treat them all the wet forms with injection, so it's less relevant. But you're not going to see many fluorescein angiograms conducted today. Equivocal cases, new diagnoses perhaps, but now we really follow these people with optical coherence tomography, OCT imaging, which is beautiful because it's non-invasive. There's no injection of any medication in the back of the eye. And the light that's used to take these photographs for the OCT is um, outside of the visual spectrum. So you don't even have to dilate the eye. There's no a stimulation for constriction and the patients don't feel that nauseous stimulus of a really bright light that they may have with other imaging modalities for the back of the eye. So OCT has really revolutionized our ability to image macular degeneration and determine wet from dry. And so our, our technology has improved. The upper image there is what we call which is what we call time domain OCT. When I started training, that was the images we had, and we thought these were absolutely amazing and high resolution. The lower image below shows a more modern spectral domain OCT. You can just see how beautifully you can see all of the layers of the retina and identify any pathology. So in uh, macular degeneration, the OCT for wet macular degeneration will show something that's represented here. Here you can see fluid under the retina, under the retinal pigment epithelium, and more importantly, those black areas of fluid within the retina itself. They can show the response to treatment, so that's an actual patient before and after treatment for their wet macular degeneration. And you can see as the treatment dries up the retina, the fluid and the blood disappears, and the OCT reverts to a more normal appearance. So there's another example before and after treatment. And then we look for recurrence on the OCT. So the OCT is so fine, it'll pick up very, very early recurrences of wet macular degeneration, perhaps even before the patient is aware that things are changing again at the back of the eye and really helps guide our treatment. 
So this is an example again of blood and fluid in an active cordially vascular membrane of wet macular degeneration. This is an inactive one, so that's just a little bump of scar tissue on the OCT, but there's no fluid or those black um, pockets around it. This is a subretinal hemorrhage. So one thing that the OCT does not show well is a hemorrhage or blood. And that's why it's always important to look in the eye uh, to help interpret the findings of the OCT when a patient comes for an exam. And that's the pigment epithelial detachment shown there. A couple more here. And then this is a pigment epithelial detachment associated with fluid within the retina as well. So this is definitely a patient that requires therapy and corresponding OCT. In dry macular degeneration, we can image the drusen. So sometimes we can see the drusen, sometimes we can see a ton, a lot of drusen, as shown in that middle uh, OCT. But again, it's not associated with any pockets of fluid, and so we can tell the patient you still have only the dry form of macular degeneration. So how do we treat the condition now we know wet from dry? Well, dry macular degeneration is treated primarily with ocular vitamin supplementation. We learned this many years ago through the age-related eye disease study, which was actually a study put together in the States to debunk the myth that vitamins were helpful for the eye. And it turned out showing that vitamins were actually good for you and you can reduce the progression of dry macular degeneration with a supplement of vitamins that are listed here. They're primarily just antioxidants, vitamin C, vitamin E, and beta carotene in the original study. Plus you give some zinc and copper is only in there because if you take zinc with copper, you become anemic. ARIDS was modified to ARIDS 2. They wanted to see if they could come up with a better formulation because beta carotene is associated with increased risk of uh, lung cancer in smokers. And so they wanted to eliminate it and they replaced it with two other carotenoids, lutein and zeaxanthin, which turned out actually worked a bit better than the beta carotene in and of itself. They also tried to vary the concentration of zinc and copper to make um, the, the supplements um, less upsetting to the GI tract. But what's really exciting for dry macular degeneration, it's been a, a condition where, well, we could slow its progress, but we couldn't do anything about the very severe form of dry macular degeneration, that geographic atrophy. And what is exciting and very exciting today is the fact that we now have an intravitreal injection. It's actually a complement inhibitor, but it's been shown to slow the progression of the dry macular degeneration, the worst form, the geographic atrophy. So it slows and stops the progression of geographic atrophy. The problem is it doesn't reverse the atrophy that's already there. And today we're so used to the intravitreal therapies that we have for wet macular degeneration where we give it to a patient and we reverse the changes and they start to see better that we've come almost to expect that in the medical community when we stick a needle in the eye to do the patient some good to improve their vision. Whereas this medicine, it's the start of our therapy now for dry macular degeneration and it slows down the progression. So it's very exciting and, and, it, and it should be something that we should really celebrate but unfortunately people are still trying to wrap their heads around the benefit of it because of the way we've been able to successfully use intravitreal therapy and wet AMD recently. Okay, so wet AMD, the therapy for wet AMD, we'll go through a few of the older treatments and then talk about today's anti-VEGF therapy. In the past, we did used to use a laser to treat wet macular degeneration. I think there's a picture, yeah, one of my patients here that I treated with a laser. So we could take these abnormal blood vessels that were growing in the back of the eye and we could actually burn them away with a laser. And we did this for a lot of patients. We even did it when it was right underneath the very center of the macula years and years ago when we had no other therapy because at least you stopped it from getting larger, but you would permanently and forever destroy the retina that was overlying the membrane with the laser. So it became something we could apply for a patient like this where there's a coriolean vascular membrane on the angiogram, but it's not in the center of the back of the eye. So that's just a picture there of before and after the treatment. But of course, we leave the patient with a permanent blind spot or scotoma where we've done the treatment. And so we wanted something that worked a little bit better. There's another example of a laser therapy. And we evolved that to photodynamic therapy, which was this 
cool laser, this less destructive laser therapy. And we give the patient a dye, similar to how we'd inject it for a fluorescein angiogram, and that dye would concentrate in the abnormal blood vessels at the back of the eye, and then we could burn away just those blood vessels and leave the overlying retina intact. But the problem was it worked great, but those blood vessels used to open back up. So we'd have to repeat the therapy and repeat the therapy. And each time there was some damage to the choroid and to the retina. And so the cumulative effect was more, again, we were slowing down progression. We weren't reversing the vision loss. We weren't really giving the patients what they wanted, which was better vision when they started to lose vision from wet macular degeneration. So that evolved to our current form of therapy, the intravitreal injections. And it really revolutionized, just completely evolved the way that we practice in ophthalmology. There are some other older treatments, surgeries and stuff like that. We'd even used to pick up the macula sometimes and this patient would actually move the macula over um, with macular translocation therapy that's shown here. But again, these are very old historic um, therapies that are basically not used today at some special circumstances where I might remove a membrane um, that exists in histo or something like that. But basically, these older treatments are now completely replaced with anti-VEGF therapy. And so the story of anti-VEGF therapy is a very interesting one. So VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, is a required um, uh, component, you know, of any organ that's growing and developing. You need it in order to produce blood vessels, but if you have too much of it around, you start to generate these abnormal uh, blood vessels. And so people were targeting VEGF because they found out that in cancer therapy, tumors had to grow new blood vessels in order for the tumors to continue to grow. And so people were suppressing VEGF, turning off VEGF um, in order to stop cancers from growing. And interestingly, some people observed that by doing that, some patients who had wet macular degeneration and receiving anti-VEGF therapy for cancer, their membranes started to regress. And it's the whole beginning of a whole new therapy in ophthalmology to get rid of these abnormal blood vessels in macular degeneration. So what happens with the VEGF? It sits here, it's on the vascular endothelial cell at the back of the eye. When VEGF binds to the receptor on the, on the cell, it causes the generation of these abnormal blood vessels. And that's shown here in a patient with diabetes, but the same thing is happening under the retina and macular degeneration. And if you can block VEGF and stop it, then it's not able to bind to its receptor. And these cells are starved for VEGF. They no longer have it, and they undergo apoptosis or cellular death. So they actually die, they go away, and those membranes disappear, which is why it's so beautiful, because it truly reverses the pathology in wet macular degeneration. Again, it's, a necessary, um, it's necessary to have VEGF for many um, systems in our body for bone morphogenesis, for stabilization of, of, the, of, of even vessels in our heart, in our gut. And so you'll have to be careful when you turn it off on a systemic basis because for, you know, it's lethal, for example, for a developing fetus. So we have to be very, very careful when we use this therapy in pregnant women. Um, it can have a lot of toxicities on a systemic level. But the concept of actually being able to inject it and deliver it into the eye therefore spares the rest of the body of these adverse effects of turning off VEGF on a systemic basis. And by targeting the therapy to the eye, we vastly reduce any negative effect. And there's many, many compounds over the years that have been developed to block VEGF. But really in Canada today, um, the first one that was approved for the eye was Lucentis. And this is one of the first plots to just show how a, much of a fundamental shift it was in therapy. Our best alternative therapy was losing vision at the time, and suddenly once we had this, we noticed right away patients' vision started to improve after their first injection in the eye. And I was involved as an investigator in many of these initial nautical series of trials, they call it, and they were supposed to be blinded trials, not knowing who was getting the injection and who wasn't. But it was very obvious after a couple of injections that patients were running into clinic 
like we're smiling, we're happy, we're seeing better, we're seeing their grandkids' faces again for the first time in years. And you could tell who was on the therapy and who wasn't. It was such a massive improvement in their ability to see. So it's been an unequaled and unparalleled success really in medicine with profound impact now for our patients and our ability to control wet macular degeneration. The big three molecules that we have for stopping it, of course, are Lucentis, Ilea, and Avastin. Um, we can compare and contrast them in a whole bunch of different ways, um, but I think this is more detailed than we probably need. Suffice it to say that Lucentis was initially approved as a once a month injection for a patient for years and years. When Ilea came out, they were gutsy enough to space it out to every two months, but it turns out that actually you can space out almost all your anti-VEGF therapy beyond one month, beyond two months, even in practical therapy. And of course, in Ontario, here, we're lucky we don't have to use a Vastin, which was never formulated to be given in the eye because we have provincial funding and access to the on label medications for wet macular degeneration. These are again just showing the profound improvement in patients' vision. But the problem is how do we achieve this? And the problem is we have to continuously dose the patient with this medication injection after injection after injection. And so our days become filled with giving patients needles in the back of the eye, which I think is very fun and exciting. But even my own children tell me it's quite boring. So when they come for, you know, grade nine, bring your kid to work day with both of my, all three of my kids actually got to do it. The youngest guy came on a surgery day, so he thought my life is very exciting. But my oldest two came on an injection clinic day where I was injecting two eyes of 60 patients in a row. And he just found this to be incredibly boring. He said to me, he said, Dad, you know, I'm not trying to say that, that your life is boring, but it sure is fantastically repetitive. Don't you do something else? And, and Jenna came and that said the same experience. And I could tell she was completely bored until one of our glaucoma surgeons, Dr. Berman, came in and rescued her from my clinic. And he said, come, what do you do a laser treatment to reduce somebody's pressure in their eye? And, you know, my son had finished his day with me, and the highlight was when I gave him $20 to go to the Tim Hortons in the hospital and buy snacks for uh, my team. And his report on Bring Your Kid to Work Day celebrated his father because he works in a building that has a Tim Hortons in it. <laughs> and Jenna got to see Dr. Berman lower the pressure in the eye, and she came in and she said, the most exciting thing in the world that this patient had a pressure of 16, and he did a laser, and then it was 15. And I was like, come on, Jenna, we're saving hundreds of people's vision by injections, but it's just kind of repetitive and boring and not fun for the patient. So it's hard even to sell the beauty of this to my own children. So there's issues with trying to keep injecting patients. We only have a limited number of qualified injectors. We have to manage other conditions. And of course, there's burnout, there's holidays, there's forced closures. We saw this during the pandemic. Our hospital has closures now for the three weeks in the summer and two weeks at Christmas and one week in March. And so it's hard to get these patients if they need monthly injections to come in and get their injections. It's also difficult, there's potential side effects. Every time you stick a needle in a patient's eye, you can cause an infection theoretically, you can increase the pressure, you can damage the lens of the eye, you can tear the retina if you're not doing it right. You have to get people to your clinic to give these injections. And, you know, it's winter in Canada. You can't tell today, obviously. But, you know, a lot of my patients come from Pembroke. They come from Deep River. They come from a lot of places, Cornwall, Brockville, wherever. And they're driving in the winter month after month to get in to see me. And there's been patients in car accidents and, 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 and couldn't make it in. So, you know, there's all those issues uh, patients get sick with other illnesses, get admitted with a broken hip, heart failure, they can't come in to get their injections. And then there's this tremendous burden on, on the families of some of these patients because they can't drive or they can't drive at least on the day of an injection. So they have to burden their children who, uh, their kids are often in that sandwich generation. So they're trying to deal with their young kids and then they're trying to bring mom and dad into the retina clinic for injections. So it's a hugely consuming um, it, issue for society. There's the cost, not only the cost of the medications themselves, but also the visit with the physician and all those imagings uh, um, that we take when the patients come that I was showing you earlier to see how they're doing. And there's rising demand for the healthcare budget in so many other areas. We look about the massive shortage of family
family physicians, how overcrowded the emergency department is. So we need sort of a better way to deliver this therapy that's more um, um, acceptable to, to society and patients. So what we really do in clinic is typically when you come in for your wet AMD therapy, we'll load you with that anti-VEGF therapy with three doses over three months. And then we try to spread it out and we check the eye. And every time it's inactive, we keep elongating the time between your visit to see us in clinic. And we used to push it out to as long as 12 weeks, but now we go to 14, um, 16 weeks routinely between injections. I'll skip through that. The question of when to stop can be a whole nother hour and a half lecture as well. Um, but it's, it's, it's a, big, um, a big debate, we'll put it that way. Um, so what is the future going to be like? What are other treatments that are coming? Well, you know, we've been talking about retinal chip implants in the bionic eye for many years, and it's been successfully implanted in several patients. These chips, photosensitive chips, the back of the eye, that they try to wire into the occipital cortex to send a signal. But of course, the, the vision experience is very rudimentary in this technology. So we haven't evolved that to a realistic therapeutic option yet. There's transplantation, there's stem cells that are injected in the eye, transplants of the retina and the retinal pigment epithelium, and they have been successful. The problem is those new cells that are in the back of your eye, we can't get the signal from those cells to travel through the wiring of the optic nerve and get to your brain, because of course, the, the optic nerve grew as an outpoaching from the brain and grew forward to the eye. And that's how it got all wired in and connected. So how do we now put new cells into the eye and get them connected to the brain? So it's got a lot of limitations uh, right now. Gene therapy is very exciting. We've seen it for Leber's congenital amaurosis, a condition which has one known genetic cause. You can then put a better version of that defective gene into a virus, inject the virus in the eye, gets incorporated into the cellular structure in the eye and you can theoretically cure the disease. The problem in macular degeneration is the fact that it's a multifactorial disease, so more than one gene is implicated and there's a strong influence on environment like smoking and high blood pressure and things like that on your disease outcome. But what really is exciting from gene therapy in wet macular degeneration at least is now that we can give a coding, a genetic coding mounted on a virus and we can inject it into the eye that tells the eye how to make anti-VEGF molecules. And so you can inject that, it's incorporated into the cells in the back of the eye and now the eye itself becomes its own factory. Five minutes, done. Five minutes, good, perfect timing. And so um, the eye becomes its own factory for making the um, anti-VEGF molecules themselves. So one injection and you're done, theoretically, and you can have all the anti-VEGF you need for the rest of your life. It's very exciting. We've got two um, trials of that right now at the Eye Institute. There's ways of using these long-term depots. So this is an example of one. You can fill that little depot up with anti-VEGF therapy, and you actually do a little surgery. You insert it through the pars planet, it goes into the eye, and it slowly releases and then you can refill it once or twice a year. It still has issues. They're having issues with the ability to refill it with some of the way that the medicine is flowing out of this so it's not yet approved in Canada or not that available I should say here in Canada but it's something that a lot of effort is being placed into. And then there's these newer more modern anti-VEGF medication. So we had one recently, brolucizumab, which is a longer acting version, very exciting, extremely potent molecule, extremely effective at drying out the retina. But it sort of surpassed its, its safety toxicity level. It became so strong, it's actually a little bit toxic to the eye itself. And so we've had incidents of retinal vasculitis, which tends to occur early on in the course of therapy, but there's been some severe reports of that. And so sadly, the medicine hasn't been um, the, the promise that the potential we hoped because of these side effects. So I very rarely use it today. We do have another new molecule now approved as well here in Canada. Very exciting, um, Fericumab. It's, it's uh, another sort of more potent, more strongly packed dose of anti-VEGF therapy that goes into the eye that potentially can dry the retina better and you can space out your injections again. And I've been very impressed with this molecule um, since we've been using it. ILEA is being reformulated now into a quadruple strength ILEA. So instead of two milligrams, it becomes eight milligrams and a slightly larger dose. Again, to pack more VEGF into one dose and get it to last longer and suppress the disease even more uh, 
viciously. And finally, we have biosimilars. And again, we could talk about biosimilars in and of themselves um, for a long time, a whole lecture on it. But suffice to say, these anti-VEGF medications are very complex molecules to grow and, and to produce. Biosimilars are now that the um, original uh, brand name products are off patent. Biosimilars are other companies now that can produce these very complex molecules and then provide them for less cost. And so again, it speaks towards the continuing drive to try to reduce the financial burden of this therapy and make it more acceptable to society. So to summarize then, macular degeneration is the leading cause of blindness in Canada today. It is of course increasingly prevalent as our population is aging, but the future is bright. We're looking at ways to control costs now with biosimilars. We have new and innovative drugs and drug delivery systems that are coming online to try to reduce the burden of the treatment. And now for once we have injectable medications for dry macular degeneration. So thank you so much for your attention and I look forward to the questions later on and now to hear some patients who are living this experience. We are going to give Dr. Hurley a little break, have some water, and then we'll be back shortly to answer the questions uh, from the room and online. Um, so for our next uh, part of our um, session this morning, I'd like to introduce uh, three of our panelists who are going to share their personal experiences of living with AMD. Um, so, yeah, we can kinda come on up. So I'm just gonna introduce our panelists while they make their way up to uh, the table here. So uh, Heather uh, Christie resides in Kempville, Ontario. Uh, Heather is a retired federal public servant, and she's been an advocate for um, people living with vision loss for many years as both of her sons uh, were diagnosed with a inherited retinal disease called choroideremia. Uh, she was diagnosed with AMD about 10 years ago. Uh, Claire Pollan was born in Greenfield, Ontario, and she's now retired and lives in Ottawa and is very involved in uh, the old Forge Community Resource Centre and Blind Choir. She's lived with AMD for over 20 years. And Sheena Watterson is here from Canada. Sheena's a retired nurse and lactation consultant. And she has been living with a geographic atrophy since 2016 and is currently taking place uh, or taking part in a clinical trial. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'd love to start by asking each of you sort of when you were first diagnosed and how this uh, diagnosis impacted you. So Heather, do you mind if we start with you? Okay. Yeah. The question. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so when were you first diagnosed and how did that diagnosis impact you? Uh, well, I've retired um, almost 18 years ago, so it didn't impact my work life. Um, my diagnosis came about 10 years ago, but because I uh, live in a family of uh, loss of vision with my sons, it's sort of uh, all, all of the impacts are sort of expected. You know what's going to happen. Um, in my professional life, I managed an accessibility center in the federal government, so I did know something. But past that, I can't tell you anything else. <clears throat> Thank you. And Claire, how about you? When were you diagnosed, and how did that diagnose, diagnosis impact you? I Actually, I was diagnosed by my optometrist in the late 1990s, um, but he just said that I was on my way to getting it. Um, then, officially, I was um, told that I had macular degeneration in, in, in 2002. Um, and I've been living with it ever since. I had wet macular degeneration at the beginning, um, where I got uh, the laser treatment, but it was thankfully not in my uh, direct sight uh, path, so it didn't affect my sight at that time. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it, it's been it's been a, a actually at the very beginning when I was diagnosed, I didn't realize the impact that it would have on my life until much later. I, my, I, my late husband was devastated uh, when he found out, but I really was not, um, 
affected that much by it at the time, but later on I got to know that, uh, yes, it, it, uh, it did impact my life quite a bit. And Gina, could you also share when you were first diagnosed and how you felt about that diagnosis? I was diagnosed by my optometrist and referred to Dr. Britton when I was um, age 71. And um, at first, as Claire said, I didn't realize the implications that it would have on my life. And I really knew very little. And I, I, I was surprised at myself on reflection that I wasn't more curious. Uh, whether it was a question of just a little bit of denial, perhaps I didn't want to know, I'm not sure. I saw Dr. Britton um, three times and he diagnosed a uh, dry macula in both eyes. And then um, he referred me to um, Dr. Truly for the study on geographic atrophy. And I started that in 2020. Um, I have been having injections since that time. My, my left eye went wet and I now receive uh, injections in that eye as well. And I have injections for um, the dry medication, which I have the, it's Pegacetolin, it's a long name. And um, it's now being used in the US for a dry macula. And shortly, I believe, to be um, um, used by Health Canada, but I have no information about when that would be. Is that enough? Yes, that's great. Thank you so much. <laughs> So um, Dr. Hurley outlined several different types of potential treatments. So I'd love to hear about each of your treatment experiences. So Heather, having dry AMD, have you had any sort of treatment? Do you take uh, vitamins like Dr. Hurley said? Um, I've received no treatments. I've received no reference to get any treatments. I do take Vitalex very regularly, very uh, honestly, and that's about it. And, oh, oh, sorry, wait. Oh, okay. Um, I get injections in my eyes every three months, uh, and I have had these for quite a few years now. Uh, actually, I'm getting one on Thursday. <laughs> um, and I also, of course, take the arid um, formula vitamin religiously. So, um, and, and I developed um, glaucoma as well from, I guess, from the injections. They, they might have contributed, but it's under control. So I'm, I'm doing fine. And have you the, all... The injections that I got at the very beginning, I thought they were really improving my sight. Like overnight, the next day, I would see so much clearer. Um, now I find it's not quite as obvious that they're in, but my eyesight is stable. And were your injections always three months apart, or did that interval change? Always three change? months apart. Yeah. And uh, Sheena, you spoke a little bit about the, the clinical trial that you've been part of and receiving those uh, injections, the pegs at a Copeland. Am I saying that one right? Yes, I'm getting the nod from Dr. Hurley, so That's I got okay. that one right. Um, so could you talk a little bit more? What's the experience been like of being part of that trial? Mostly that I had to give up driving. Mm. and I had to become dependent on my family. It was big loss. Um, being, you know, a super independent person all my life, to have to um, use paratranspo, which has been immeasurable. It's so helpful. And uh, when I go to the store, the impact on not being able to really see what is available. I can no longer read. I've been a, a member of a book club for 24 years. We do one book a month, but thank goodness for Audible. Uh, I really welcome that. I still do 11 books a year and involved in all the discussions. So, you know, it's, um, it has had an impact. 
And thank goodness for good friends and family. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, did you want to know about the injections? Yeah, I'm just curious, the clinical trial experience, what's that been like for you going through that process? Um, I've, I've, I almost kind of enjoy going now because they're like my family, part of my family, because I, um, I go every month because I, I was monthly in the clinical trial for Pega. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, but currently I'm having injections for wet in my left eye as well as the new drug for the geographic atrophy and I'm having the new drug in my right eye um, in the study, I do not yet know if I was receiving sham or the drug. That enough? <laughs> yes, that's great. Thank you. Um, so you've talked. Everyone's talked a little bit about this, but do you? Maybe I'll start with you, Heather. Do you have um, any sort of concerns for the future or things that you're you're worried about? Well, the loss of a driver's license is definitely one thing. A year ago, my optometrist had told me I was on the line. This past year, she said I was teetering. So here we are, uh, waiting for the other shoe to, to drop. Um, that is my biggest uh, issue because uh, I, I am very um, required. I have two uh, blind adult children who do have wives, but I am sort of the relief for their family to do that. I'm also very active in the Lions Club, so I do a lot of vision testing with kids, and so I can see the progression of loss of vision or problems with vision. Claire, what about you? Do you have any sort of concerns or things that you're particularly thinking about for your future? Um, it's, it's difficult to say. I, I do get along on my own quite a bit. I'm very independent, and so, uh, but I do, like uh, Heather was saying, it's hard in to go shopping because you can't see, so I always have to have a companion with me when I, if I go to a store. Um, and that has been fairly easy to find. I have volunteers who uh, have been helping me. Um, Apart from that, I live alone and I'm fairly independent. I still cook for myself and uh, I get around a lot. <laughs> so that, That's great to hear. And um, what about you, Sheena? You spoke a little bit about this, but anything else to add? Like you said, you've, you know, not driving anymore, but you are adapting to that. Are there other things that you're thinking about? Yes, I, uh, I want to stay in my own home, as Claire stated. I live alone and um, I manage wa well. So I, I'm hopeful that life will continue the same and, uh, and uh, optimistic. Mm -hmm. So uh, the next question, again, we've touched a bit on this already, but what resources um, do you use right now to sort of help um, with your vision or the things that you maybe anticipate that you will be using in the future? Uh, Heather, maybe we could start with you. Well, one of the things that I would strongly recommend to people is to get used to uh, audiobooks and to get used to anything on uh, that is available on a computer that will allow you to do things in the future because there are so many things. The biggest problem I find is that there's not that many uh, places where the average person has access to be able to see all these things, to be able to experience what is available, and to receive training. Absolutely. Um, what about you, uh, Claire? Any other resources that you would recommend? I am an avid, well, reader. I was an avid reader. Now I'm an avid listener. Uh, I use, I have a Victor Reader and I get books, my books from Sila, sometimes two, three a week. Um, and uh, I use a computer um, quite easily. Uh, it has the Zoom text 
program that makes everything big and they talk to me, so it's quite easy. Um, I also belong to an organization called the Old Forge and they've been very, very supportive in supplying uh, technicians if I need them. Like just, just recently I was, um, managed to get a new computer and they, they found a couple of technicians to help me uh, transfer data and, and set, set it all up for me. Uh, I use Paratranspo on a regular basis and I don't know what I do without them. Mm -hmm. um, I go everywhere with them and it's really uh, quite wonderful. It's a, people complain about the service but I would never uh, complain because I find it's just wonderful. Yes. Excellent. And uh, Claire, or sorry, Sheena, what about you? Any um, I, I second Paratranspo. I, I mean, they are a wonderful organization, and I don't think they're appreciated enough. I would like to uh, have a volunteer to help me with computer, although I'm just using the iPad at the moment, and I do find with, when I get the print enlarged, I can do some things with it but I haven't had much luck getting help with the computer, so I may try the Old Forge, if that's... The Old Forge, and they have a, a bank of volunteers, uh, and that's how I, I was yeah. able to get in. But I also got help from the CNIB. Um, wow. And the, uh, and the CCB, I should say. Both have been uh, helping me in different ways, which is, uh, it, it, it's really nice, I mean, I used to be, <laughs> I, I don't like to look back because I find that, you know, it's better to look forward. Uh, but I was an artist, I was painting miniatures, uh, and I was also, um, and uh, I wrote and um, edited, I was an editor, um, director of finance, and all those things had to be left behind. Uh, so it's been a complete redo of my life. But I find with all this help around me, with the volunteers and the Old Forge and, um, and, and even Dr. Tooley, who's been absolutely wonderful, um, I've, I think my life is, is, is great. I'm, I'm very fortunate. I still have quite a bit of sight, I think, compared to a, a lot of other people. But um, yeah, yeah, I think I'm, I'm one of the fortunate ones. And I will say that Claire has written two books. She has her memoirs and a book of poems and short stories, and she brought some here today. So if you're interested, she has a few copies as well to, <laughs> to share. That, that kept me sane during the pandemic, I tell you. Yeah, wonderful. <laughs> I did, I enjoyed writing so much. Uh, but I had knee replacement surgery uh, a year ago, and for some reason, I haven't been able to write much since then. So I don't know what it did to my mind, but <laughs> but I did get those two books done, which was wonderful. I've had one short story since then, and and uh, one poem, one or two poems, but wonderful. nothing earth shattering. And I was going to say, Sheena, I'm sure there's. A I have the book. Oh, and. Uh, the books that I wrote, uh, when I wrote them, I self-published, and I donated all the proceeds to the CNIB and the CCB. And so, if anybody wants any, uh, I have a couple of books with me. If anybody wants them, and all I ask is that they would consider making a donation to the blind. That's wonderful. And she, and I was going to say, I think there's probably a few people in the room who could help you with your computer or, or, or point you in the right direction to get some, some help great. your tech support. So my last question to everyone on the panel, um, just in closing, is sort of what advice would you give to someone who has been recently diagnosed with uh, either wet or dry uh, AMD? H Heather, why don't we start on this end? Well, I think it's what I just said before, is to, to realize that uh, the future involves you know, learning many other things and to start to get used to audio books and, and anything that will help you on your computer because there's a great world out there and uh, you can't stop enjoying it. Lovely, thank you. Claire? I would, if someone was just got the diagnosis, the first thing I would say is be sure to take the vitamins, the arid formula vitamins. I think that's a, a wonderful uh, key that we have to keep 
keep the progression lower. Uh, the other thing is to make sure that you do get to see an ophthalmologist if you don't have one already. And then to not be afraid to ask for help um, and to look around at the different organizations that are there. There's quite a few. Um, there's the CCB, the CNIB, there's ABLE II, uh, the Old Forge. And if you live in different areas, it might be Ottawa West or Western Ottawa. They're all there to help and they all have volunteers at their service. So don't be afraid to ask for help. Absolutely. And Sheena? Um, one thing I didn't mention was that I was, um, when I was first diagnosed, I searched for a support group and I was disappointed that there wasn't one and I wondered if there would ever be a future support group for early macular diagnosis. It would be helpful. It's a great idea and we'll have to talk to our friends at CCB in the room, see what they've got on. <clears throat> Are there any other advice or tips that you would give to anyone who'd been recently diagnosed? Well, I, I, I think Claire's um, information about uh, the old forge having, I, 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 I didn't uh, realize that I could reach out because I've tr kind of uh, been hinting at friends, you know, and they get a bit worn out. So in, in order not to wear people out, to have more people available would be so helpful to, to volu volu more volunteers to help, yeah. Absolutely. The only thing is, right now, the Old Forge is struggling for funding, like uh, yeah. probably a lot of other organizations. The wait list for some of the programs is quite long. Yeah. Um, but if you're fortunate enough to get in, then there are quite mm. a few services available. And uh, I did go uh, down to Lansdowne and, and <clears throat> tried out some of the equipment to the CNIB, the, mm -hmm. um, the and I understand there is um, a Waterloo study that's studying reader machines, but I don't have any information on that. Okay, wonderful. Well, we'll have a, we'll, I'm sure our friends at CCB and CNIB can tell us a bit more about that as well. Um, all right, well, thank you all three very much for joining us today and for sharing your experience. We really appreciate you being here and taking the time. Right, so we are going to uh, move on now to our so audience questions for Dr. Hurley. So um, just give us uh, one minute to get set up up here. But um, for our friends who are joining us online, you can send your questions in again in two ways. There's that Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom. You can uh, click that, type in your question and press send. Or you can email us directly at education at fightingblindness.ca. Uh, so we have a question, does dry AMD turn into wet? Or if you have dry and then you get wet in the same eye, do you now have both in that eye? And can wet turn into dry? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. So we, you know, we classically think of, of macular degeneration progressing from dry to wet. The first changes that are seen in an aging eye are some loss of the retinal pigment epithelium, uh, deposition at the level of Brooks membrane formation of Drusen. So people will typically start with changes that are found in dry macular degeneration. And in and of themselves, you maintain excellent vision with just those dry macular degenerative changes until it progresses to geographic atrophy. So most people will start with changes of dry. And then wet macular degeneration is usually heralded by a rather abrupt change in symptoms. And so when the coronal ascarum membrane forms, when those blood vessels break through Brooks membrane, break through the RP, come into the subretinal space from the choroid, there's often a fairly dramatic and rapid change. So people will notice a blind spot, a scotoma, uh, they'll start to see a lot of distortion in their vision is also a, a hallmark. So the dry is this slow, indolent progression that a lot of people don't know they have the disease. Wet is usually quite a dramatic change and you, hopefully people will come to their um, eye care professional at that time. So yes, that's how we think about dry going to wet. Now that is a great point that when you have wet, 
you still have dry. So those dry degenerative changes, the atrophy, the loss of cells, the drusen accumulation, that is still going on. And that's why there's that misconception that, well, now I'm on therapy for wet macular degeneration, I can stop considering therapy for dry macular degeneration. But sadly, what happens is we can dry you out, we can shut down the coronary vascular membrane, but then we're seeing, and I think this was well described by one of our panelists earlier, that effect that they had such great responses from the injections early in their disease course, but then later in the disease course, they didn't notice the benefit as much, and it's usually associated with progression of the underlying dry degeneration. So yes, both are happening in your eye, and um, you should therefore still do what you can to prevent the progression of the dry macular degeneration, even while you're on therapy for wet macular degeneration. Now, can you go back so that you're totally dry again? You know, I tell people once you're wet, we always have to think about that. We can really suppress and get rid of the coronavascular membrane. And sometimes we space your injections out a lot. And there are conditions where we stop the injections altogether and people so-called graduate out of the program. But they must be mindful that the changes that led to wet macular degeneration in the first place are still in your eye. So those spaces in Brooks' membrane or whatever allowed the coronary vascular membrane to appear. And so you have to be vigilant for forever, basically. Do we have any questions in the room? We'll bring, we'll bring a mic. Just give us one sec. Thanks, Mike. I was wondering at what point um, you might be able, have to stop driving. Yeah, so the vision requirements for driving in Ontario are very specific. It used to be a vision of uh, 20, 40 or more for a class D license uh, in one eye and a visual field that sustains uh, 120 degrees across the horizontal midline. So there are very well-defined and prescribed criteria for the privilege of driving in Ontario. And as a physician or as an eye care professional, uh, we are obligated to report a patient who falls below those standards to the Ministry of Transportation um, and, and tell them they have to start driving. The rule in Quebec is a little bit different. So Quebec, you know, um, they they see patients' rights a little bit differently and they want patients not to be scared. They're gonna be reported by their doctor, so you can still go to your doctor and have bad vision. And you know we have to tell you, but it, it, it's different, the reporting responsibilities in Quebec. But yeah, Quebec does test patients for their driver's license more frequently with visual acuity. So the two provinces and different provinces in Canada handle it a bit differently. So a vision of 2050, that's the criteria that most people lose their license on. Many people are under the misconception though that if they lose vision in one, eye, they will lose their license. So they're very scared. Oh, my vision in this eye now is bad because I'm wet. But you're allowed to drive based on the better seeing eye. So there's many people who have lost vision to detached retinas, trauma, um, amblyopia, you name it. And they're still, of course, legally allowed to drive. Um, so it's visual acuity of 2050. If it slips below that, we have to let the ministry know. There's also a visual field uh, requirement of that 120 degrees across the horizontal midline. There's no vi vertical visual field definition for driving. There's no requirements for color vision for driving that's been legislated. Um, but uh, in Quebec, there are some actual color vision so it depends a bit on the province um, so if you're not an Ontario driver the rules might be slightly different um, but yeah if you slip below 2050 then you lose your license now there's also a thing called the vision waiver program a lot of people don't know about that program so if you are uh, suspended from driving due to your um, uh, not meeting the requirements. Um, if it's from the visual field uh, aspect, then you have to go and take a special sort of training followed by a rigorous um, evaluation with an occupational therapist to make sure that your previous experience of driving allows you to maintain safe conduct on the road and the license can be reinstated. I've had many, many, many patients successfully reacquire their license through the vision waiver program. It's not an option though if your central acuity is significantly reduced. If somebody, let's say, was 2060 and you then in, injected them uh, and their vision improved to 2025, can they get their driver's license back? Yeah, absolutely. So classically for cataract, you know, uh, there's many reasons why a person's vision would slip below the legal standards and then um, it improves to the point that uh, they can see again. Uh, 
detached retinas, cataract, you name it, right? And so um, I'm always careful. So if a patient comes in, their vision slips below the legal standards, but I know there's a, a viable therapeutic option that's going to restore it to the uh, the standard required for driving quickly, you know, I'm not going to report them because, oh my goodness, it is a hassle to get the license back. I've had many patients where it's suspended. Um, and, and, you know, not just eye doctors suspend your license, right? So people come to emerge with their detached retina and the eMERGE doc suspends them as they are obligated to do. And then I fix the detached retina and they can drive again. Um, but now they've got to go through that process of reinstatement, which certainly takes time. Um, and so if someone's vision has very transiently reduced, be it corneal edema, be it for whatever purpose that's very treatable, um, then you're advised the patient not to drive until you see better. Um, but once it's reported, um, it's, 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 it's absolutely can come back. It's just a lot more paperwork for the patient and sometimes for the physician. Did, did you still have a follow-up question? Night driving. <laughs> I was just wondering if there were any more specific specifications for night driving yeah. or if so in Ontario, we don't have restricted licenses that preclude somebody from driving at night. If you meet the criteria for driving, you can drive in any condition and, and time of day. Um, on the Quebec side, though, again, things are different. So there is actually uh, one of the lines I'll say, um, do you, um, you know, should this patient not drive at night? And you can check that off. So that exists on the Quebec, but not Ontario side. And I imagine those are different in other provinces if we have online. Exactly, yeah. So if we have people from, from the Maritimes, um, you know, different provinces, so some are still at the 2040 level for visual acuity for driving. Others have proposed a 2060 level uh, for driving, so there's slight differences in, in the required central acuity based on where you live, and of course your type of license. And so we're talking about a class D license, but I deal with many people of class A, B, C, you know, transport truck drivers, school bus drivers, ambulance drivers, you name it. And so there's different specifications for different licenses. So, you know, for example, class C, it has to be 2100 or better in the worst seeing eye and 2040 or better in the better seeing eye. If it's a class A, both eyes have to be 2040 or better. So there are differences based on the type of license, which is very important if you're a taxi cab driver or, or, or something like that, your license requirements are different. But you can go down from one type of license to another. So sadly, I've had patients who are truck drivers their license but still can maintain the ability to drive um, their family vehicle. Okay, we're going to take one question from online and then we'll come back to the room. So we've had lots of questions here about vitamins. Mm. Um, so would love for you to clarify sort of what um, the, the role is in AMD, about, a little bit about ARIDS, but also um, many people are asking, is it a good idea to use these vitamins, even if you don't have mm. AMD or maybe if you have a family history of AMD, is it a good idea to take them uh, preventatively or earlier on? Yeah, excellent, excellent question. So we talk about evidence in medicine based on the level of evidence that something is. So, you know, you can hear from a doctor that it's a good idea and that's sort of the lowest level of evidence. If you have an excellent um, double-blinded, well, we don't use blinded, but double-masked, uh, placebo-controlled study, um, which is rigorously uh, investigated, overseen by a monitoring committee, it, you produce very, very high level of evidence. So the highest level of evidence we have comes from the ARID study with respect to vitamin supplementation. Okay, and so they used antioxidant vitamins plus zinc and copper. And then they switched that, as we talked about earlier, to avoid beta-carotene and lose lutein and zeaxanthine. And the exact doses were well characterized by that study. And that study proved conclusively that yes, it does slow down the rate of dry macular degenerative um, progression at a certain level of AMD. And that's what a lot of people forget. So it showed no benefit over 10 years if you had very mild changes. That's because the rate of change for someone who only has a few drusen, a few pigmentary alterations is so slow, the study wasn't able to capture a difference. So we can't say to you, you have very early macular degeneration, take these vitamins and help. We don't have that evidence. Okay, so that evidence is not there. You had to be intermediate or higher. So one eye had to have cordial vascular membrane or geographic atrophy, or you had to meet the criteria for you know, significant can change is defined on the number of juice and the size of the juice in the backyard. So for people with more advanced disease, there's unquestionably a well-supported clinical trial to show that it's beneficial. 
Now, we look at lower levels of evidence, okay? So there's lower levels of evidence where they compare what people eat and don't eat and the sort of um, they do dietary surveys on patients. And this has suggested that, yes, over many years, there is a much lower rate of progression for patients who are taking these antioxidant vitamins or at least consuming them. Again, you don't have to take the pills to get them. There's lots of good fresh fruits and vegetables that are excellent sources of these and probably better metabolized by the body. Uh, but, you know, we see in these kind of population surveys that people who are using more of these types of antioxidants have lower rates of progression. But you can't say that it's a definitive cause and effect because you haven't controlled for other variables. So we may just be sampling a, a group of people who exercise more, who are less likely to smoke, or who do something else that's associated with eating these fresh fruits and vegetables. We can't definitively say it, but there's evidence out there, but it's of lower quality. And and that's why, personally, I don't push ocular vitamin supplementation on patients with lower levels of degenerative changes in their back of their eye. But what I do push are things that we absolutely know for sure. Stop smoking. So overwhelmingly beneficial to you, far exceeding any benefit from vitamins. Start exercising. You know, if you have a dog, take a dog for a walk every day. If you don't have a dog, just take a leash or your spouse or whatever. And you drag them along for a walk every day. Um, you know, maintaining a healthy body weight. Um, uh, you know, having good a, a good balanced diet. It's so helpful, you know, beyond the eye. And so these factors, people say, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? I say, listen, go for a walk every day. You know, listen to your doctor. Like, how many men take their blood pressure pills? You know, they don't. Um, so do all kinds of things can be overwhelmingly beneficial for you and your eye and the rest of your body as well, uh, beyond just um, trying to pop some pills for vitamins. I always go for a healthy lifestyle first. And just a follow-up question, uh, we had someone online, Rod, he's asking, are there any differences in the particular supplements that are available? So he mentions Preservision or yeah. Vitalux. Is there one that you usually recommend or are they all much the same? Yeah, and, 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 and the drugstores have their own generic versions of them. And of course, there's nothing magical about taking them in one pill. I know many patients will go to the, the health food store and they'll buy them individually and, and take them. They, sometimes as powders. You know, you can get some of these as powders, you can mix in a drink and it's more palatable. So um, one of the main differences between the pills, the size of the pills, uh, you know, some of them are larger than others. People have more tr difficulty swallowing them. There's chewable forms, which are easier to take for some, but they basically all have the same ingredients in them. Be careful with some of the chewable forms, um, really easy to take. And I know a lot of patients have trouble swallowing. But if you're diabetic, the chewable ones, it's held together with a sugar, you know, so there is some, some sugar in it um, that you have to know about. Um, but no, if you're taking any of those forms, if, they're, if it says ARIDS2 formula on it, uh, you're getting the right stuff. Uh, any questions in the room? Over here, yep. I had two questions about uh, the different medications you were talking about. The first one being the complement inhibitor. Mm -hmm. um, you said that that was slowing slash stopping the geographic atrophy. If at the initial diagnosis you started taking that medication as prescribed, uh, would that be the guarantee that you wouldn't then develop or it would just slow it down? Yeah, excellent question. And, and you make a very good point of starting it early, right? Because in a lot of these studies, we didn't show a benefit from visual acuity because we started in patients who were already advanced geographic atrophy. So we stopped it, but they're like, ah, I'm not seeing better. But yet if you start it before it gets to the center of your fovea, imagine you can protect and save the fovea and, and have reading vision then potentially for a long, long, long time. Unfortunately, no, it doesn't completely stop the disease. And, and so you're going to probably see some underlying lesion growth, but at a slower rate. That's what we know uh, from analyzing uh, the data. Um, but uh, excellent. I'm glad you raised that point about the benefit of early uh, initiation of this form of therapy. Thank you. And then uh, just the second question about the uh, VEGF. Um, when you were talking about introducing the virus so that you can create your own VEGF within the eye, um, were you seeing systemic effects of the suppression of the VEGF or that was still solely in the eye? 
So, um, I've got a couple patients in that study, and we're taking everything. I mean, they take blood samples, they take, um, we, we actually stick a needle in the eye and withdraw some aqueous fluid so we can analyze how much VEGF is in the eye at different time periods. So, there, it's, it's, it's intensely studied and monitored because you're correct, if that uh, gene sort of escapes the eye, makes it into systemic therapy, well, are you going to suppress it too much? So, that's a very good question, and that's one of the important um, reasons it's being studied very, very closely. Um, to look for any of those effects. Um, so I haven't seen, you know, but it's early on. Okay, I have a couple questions online, and then I think there's another one in the room. So we have a lot of questions about this injection for dry AMD, um, and I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about we're, we're that and why um, people are asking if they can get it in Canada, on. and if you talk a little bit about what's happening with that injection. Yeah, it's an exciting injection. I've been using it now for years within the context of a clinical trial. And so I've had patients who've been receiving many, many injections on it, and the comment that I have is, of course, in that trial, you're only receiving it in one eye. So what a great case control. So again, lower evidence, lower level of evidence, but, but you know, patients will say, boy, I see so much better in this eye than my other eye. I wish I'd gotten the injection in both eyes. Um, that's been some of the feedback I've received. But of course, you know, don't, don't put too much emphasis on one, patient or two patients making these comments. You know, we can talk a lot about placebo effects and other things as well. So um, the, the medicine is now available in the United States. It's being used in the United States. I think it's not being used as much as had been anticipated initially because, again, patients hear from their friends, well, I have wet macular degeneration. I'm not seeing very well. Suddenly I got these injections, I'm seeing better. So then somebody walks in with advanced geographic atrophy, gets a few injections, and they're not seeing better. And they're like, oh, you know. So there's that letdown if people aren't appropriately informed of what to expect from the therapy. So think of it like, like we do for glaucoma therapy. Like we have to protect the optic nerve. We put them on a lot of drops to protect the optic nerve, but taking those glaucoma drops doesn't actually improve your vision. It doesn't actually bring back any of the vision you lost from your glaucoma, but it's still worth treating because you've got to save it. And so people need to understand why uh, this therapy is being introduced to them um, and think longer term in terms of salvaging what's left, hopefully catching people early on in the course so that we can save the center of the macula and keep them driving, for example. Um, it is still not, um, we can't give it to you here in Canada outside of a clinical trial yet. There are, um, like any new medicine, it has to be rigorously um, uh, uh, you know, reviewed. Um, there's concerns with potential developing wet macular degeneration on people on the therapy, but hey, we got a good treatment for that. Um, there's been some reports of inflammation at different levels of the eye, you know, the optic nerve. And so they're still looking closely at that, okay? But our, our larger neighbor to the south uh, has it. Great, and I think there was a question over here. Um, is there new technology for eyewear that uh, would help uh, for a dry um, macular degeneration? Yeah, that's a great question, and it's something I was wanting to mention because, you know, we have low vision specialty. So in ophthalmology, low vision, um, or what we now call vision rehabilitation, is a subspecialty of ophthalmology. And these are individuals dedicated to using assisted devices and, and technology in order to help maximize the vision potential. So if you've lost vision due to your dry or wet AMD and are having specific issues with functioning, say, reading the cost of things at a grocery store, you know, you know things like this. So absolutely, there's high-powered magnifiers, there's... there's things as technical as inserting interocular lens or piggyback lenses that are telescopes into the human eye. And then there's things as basic as a good handheld magnifier with an excellent light source. Because just improving illumination on what you're trying to look at can certainly help your visual functioning. So there's a myriad of technologies available. Look at how our digital life is changing so much. You know, People now scan things and it reads them to you. It's incredible. right? So you have a wide variety of of assisted devices available for people who want to improve um, you know, their visual functioning with the vision that they have left. So I really encourage the use of our colleagues, other you know, ophthalmologists. I don't do low vision, but there's 
many optometrists and ophthalmologists who specialize and do that and can give great advice. Um, Vision Rehabilitation Canada, you know, an outstanding organization with uh, low vision specialists that help you try to use this technology and adapt it to you. You know, there's been a device called the Geordie. You know the Geordie off Star Trek? Uh, I'm dating myself, but, you know, they wore that fancy thing. And so that's been actually developed right here in Ottawa by, by some people that tries to basically give you a high-power digital zoom and you can adapt contrast sensitivity and things like that on your on little controller on your belt to try to improve functioning and certainly for tech people who are more tech savvy and driven to find a technological solution uh, that's a bit more complex for their vision loss some people have really um, ha had a great experience um, with with that device for example so there's tons of good stuff out there it's just trying to get access to it finding what works well for you uh, you know based on your experiences uh, audiobooks are amazing I had um, I had a woman hadn't had a book like she was like the biggest reader ever. She loved, loved reading, loved it. Just, you know, it was her life. And then she, she sadly lost central vision on both eyes. And we couldn't bring it back to the level she read. And she was sad and depressed, very sad and very depressed. And, and we really pushed audiobooks on her and she was so resistant to it. Finally, finally she decided, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to try an audio book. I'm going to do it. And they have them and even at libraries. So she went to the local library. She found this amazing young lady who was working there. We said, yes, we have all the good books now, best sellers, top sellers available. And so this young lady recommended for her the best, most amazing, um, uh, book experience that she would love. And, uh, she took it home. And before she, um, played the book. She called our office and left a big message about how thankful she was that we we gave her this opportunity. We, we introduced this to her and how excited she was to have her first book in years and how great it was going to be. Um, but you always got to look what you get because we had another message later that same night about the vile, disgusting, horrific modern literature because they gave her 50 shades of gray. <laughs> And she was very religious. She had to go to confession several times. Okay. And <laughs> that's the book they gave. The young lady at the library, like she couldn't see the title. So I'm still wondering if, if, if she knew what she was doing. And <laughs> she wasn't laughing her head off at home too. So there's lots of good stuff out there. Just any technology can have um, unintended consequences. <laughs> I'm going to take another one online here. Um, so we have lots of questions. Uh, Miriam, Donna, they're all asking about um, sort of what are the main risk factors for AMD? Um, and if you have a family history, hmm. is there anything that you can do to prevent it? Yeah, so the biggest risk factor, unfortunately, is birthdays. And so we all like them, but the more you have... Uh, that's the single biggest risk factor. So, um, uh, so um, it varies greatly with your racial background, right? So, um, uh, Caucasian people from Northern Europe with lighter skin, lighter f eyes, um, are much more at risk. You know, the condition almost doesn't exist in African American population. We'll see polypodocortal vasculopathy, but that's that's very different. So, you know, we always think of um, you know the the age as being the number one risk factor. Um, your race, you know, things you can't control. So there's modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. So family history, genetics, okay, all that stuff, unfortunately, you can't modify. And then there's modifiable risk factors. We spoke about a couple of them. Smoking, diet, exercise, blood pressure, um, all those are known to reduce the risk of progression. So you have modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors, and um, you can't choose your parents, but you can choose your lifestyle and at least make some changes there. And a follow-up, um a couple of the people online are asking, um, this person, for example, does a lot of reading. They're asking if that um, oh, type of activity is, is affecting the progression of their AMD. Um, do yeah. sunglasses help on sunny mm. days or in snow? Yeah, th those are excellent questions. So first of all, no. Using your eye doesn't wear it out. So the me metabolism that's going on at the back of your eye, it's actually very active even at night when your eyes are closed and the room is dark. And so, you know, I've had patients who, um, you know, I had one brother come in and then another brother come in and then another brother come in and we diagnosed him, diagnosed him, diagnosed him. And then the fourth brother was sitting at home in the darkness with his eyes patched because he didn't want to wear them out. But it doesn't make any difference in the progression, okay? So um, use your eyes, do everything you want to do, live your life to the fullest, and, 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 and that's 
that's not going to be a factor. Now, um, shielding from, so UV light is a known um, initiator of the generation of oxygen-free radicals and changes in the back of the eye. And so there's, there's good reasons to have um, uh, sun protection when you're out there. Um, you know, you're going south for winter break or like you say, snow blindness, that, that strong reflections off the snow. Also, it helps your visual functioning. Okay, so it helps visual functioning. Um, you increase contrast sensitivity, particularly with like a, 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 um, a yellow or orange tint to your sunglasses. So I've had people with macular degenerative changes, dry, wet, and you know, they just, they they see well enough for drive, but they don't feel comfortable to drive. Then they get some yellow, uh, orange tinted glasses, cuts down glare, increases contrast sensitivity, and suddenly they're much more comfortable in their day-to-day -day life. That's great. I think we have a question over on this side. Yes, to circle back to the gentleman who asked about eyewear, it, it's really interesting what is now becoming available, and I'll give two examples. Uh, the Envision glasses that came out of Holland are a very interesting option for some people to take advantage of using glasses with input from uh, low vision options and voice over options on an iPhone, and yeah. it's generating more. And in Canada right now, uh, there is Celeste glasses that are going through beta testing. So there's some really interesting things. And certainly, if you have a uh, people in low vision and optometry and ophthalmology keen to look at rehabilitation options for people in that particular position, I think there's some really important things that can happen to give you more options to do things while uh, dealing with uh, vision loss because of disease. Thank you. Yeah, and it's an under it's an under serviced area, like so much of medicine, really, too. But but low vision specialists are there's not enough. Um, so a big uh, plus that we do have a new one starting soon at the Eye Institute, um, which will really help. That's great. Uh, yep, another question in the room. This one's for me. All right. I have geographic atrophy. Uh, my first diagnose was sort of self diagnosed standing at. Uh, Novartis booth looking at one of those little cards that told me I had a, um, a black scotoma, spot in the middle scotoma, of my right yeah. eye and never progressed very far. And then I went and I was told I had a macular tear and that I had trauma, which I couldn't remember. Then about a year and a half ago, I was identified as having geographic atrophy. Um, in 20 years at the CCB, and in the last 10 years, I heard very little, if nothing, about GGF atrophy to the last two and a half years. What's the difference? What's happened in the last two and a half years? So in the last two and a half years, we've had treatment options. And so that's the big difference, right? And so you're hearing a lot more about it now because we have viable therapeutic and uh, options. You know, when we have nothing we can do for somebody with a condition, we tend to sweep it under the rug a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, so we were seeing lots of patients with geographic atrophy, but we weren't paying attention to it. We weren't focusing on it. But now we're imaging these people, you know, we're doing better um, definition of how to map out the area of atrophy. Um, we're looking at the areas around the atrophy where they may develop a new preferred retinal locus where they can see a little bit better, so microperimetry. And, and so, you know, the, the, the um, autofluorescence imaging, so much has developed now because, hey, we're going to treat this condition. We've got to learn more about it. We've got to understand it. We've got to understand how it progresses. We've got to understand how to image it. Just like we're able to image and diagnose wet macular degeneration, it takes a little bit different types of imaging and to really characterize geographic atrophy. And so we're interested in it now because um, thankfully science has led us to some ways to try to um, initially stop it and slow it down and then in the future reverse it. Thank you. Um, a follow-up online about that uh, as well and someone's asking why is this new treatment only available for patients with geographic atrophy and not dry AMD generally? Yeah so so again, dry AMD generally, so if you just have some pigment alterations and some drusen in the back of the eye, you know, we've been trying to treat drusen for many years. There's the laser for drusen trial. There was, um, oh my goodness, when we used to filter the person's blood, it'll come back to me in a second. So we've had um, different ways of trying to address drusen in the past. Um, some of those studies have shown that just getting rid of your drusen doesn't really um, modify the underlying disease and progression rates. And so that's why, you know, we're, we're, we're like, why, why target those things? Um, you're not really losing vision just from Drusen. 
you know, just from a few pigmentary changes, you primarily lose visual function when the cells become atrophic. Uh, we have another question here. After receiving injections for many years, uh, their vision is slowly becoming worse. They said that their vision is now 20 over 200, and they're concerned about how bad the vision loss may get, and they're curious how, how bad can it get? Yeah, so macular degeneration, the disease by definition, stays within the macula. So you require macular, fun macular function for greater than vision greater than 2200, okay? So most people with uh, with uh, end-stage wet macular degeneration and disc form star can still sort of, as long as they can train themselves to use a bit of their peripheral vision, can still probably catch the big E on the eye chart, okay, with eccentric fixation. So you lose the very center of your vision, you lose the ability to read, you lose the ability to recognize faces, but you never go completely blind, okay? And so that's the honest truth with macular um, degeneration. Um, now, anything in medicine, there's exceptions. Yes, I've had patients who have a massive subretinal hemorrhage. I mean, these are rare things around blood thinners, um, and, and their disc form st scar causes a massive hemorrhage, and there's some catastrophic secondary effect from that. You know, but but this is this is rare, rare, rare stuff, okay? So, you know, when you have even end-stage macular degeneration, you're still going to be able to navigate a room, things like that. Um, okay, we have a bunch of questions here about um, the injections, particularly for wet. Um, so uh, one of the questions was, in the time I've been going for treatments for macular degeneration, I've had four different doctors, and each one of them has done the procedure differently. Yeah. <laughs> is there a standard procedure? Uh, why, why is that? Yeah, so this is where physicians, they see, everybody thinks their technique is the best. But it's like anything. It's like fixing an attached retina. It's like taking on a cataract. There's there's really slight nuances towards um, how to do the intravitreal injection. So there's a few steps that are very very important. Uh, so it's very important to use an anesthetic. Um, so some people like topical. Some people like um, um, the goopy gel, and some people like to do a subconjunctival injection. So personally, I find the subconjunctival injection causes a lot of uh, subconj hemorrhage. I don't really think it adds much, um, and I, I think that um, it, it, it's two injections to get one injection. You know what I mean? So there's a little bit of discomfort of causing that bleb to form in the conj by doing a little injection of the anesthetic before you do the injection of the drug. Um, uh, uh, there are topical gel people use to freeze it. The problem with that for me is that once you put the gel on there, it's harder for the antiseptic to work because it sometimes doesn't get through the gel as effectively. So I'm a huge believer in just topical anesthetics. The problem is sometimes people don't use enough. So you got to use drop after drop and then a couple more drops and then another drop and then give another drop. So you got to get a bunch of drops in. Okay. So, and this is me teaching it to residents and young people all the time. You know, I really believe in my technique, but there's other people going to believe just as strong in their technique. But as long as you get an anesthetic, as long as you get an antiseptic, Okay, so you need something on the eye, typically uh, povidone iodine or chlorhexidine, but you need something to go on there and sterilize the surface before you stick a needle through it because there's bacteria on the surface of our body, including our conjunctiva. So some people put a ton of povidone iodine all over the eye, irrigate through fornices like little where the conjunctiva is folded over a little bit. You know, they'll describe it as like cleaning a baby's bum. You got to get under every flap when you're changing the diaper and all this kind of stuff. But, you know, I find that too much, right? It's toxic to the corneal epithelium. So if you put too much on there, you're going to cause punctate epithelial erosions and breakdown of the surface of the eye, which is extremely sensitive. So I use just enough povidone iodine. And then I give the injection. Give the injection, uh, first of all, I mark the location. So unless you've got a really accurate sense of position, usually we use something to mark it. I use the end of a TB syringe. It's amazing. God invented them, so they're exactly 3.5 millimeters in diameter at the end. And amazing that that's exactly the middle of the pars plana. And so you don't need a special instrument to mark it, but some people use a special instrument or caliper or something like that to mark the injection location. And then you drive the, the needle into the eye, aiming for the optic nerve so you don't hit the lens and make sure you go through the avascular plane between the ciliary body, which will bleed, and the retina, which you don't want to put a hole in because then you could lead to detachment and stuff. So you aim the right direction and you go quick. Like it's boom, in and out, okay? And that, I think, 
provides a very painless experience. But everybody does have slight variations on how they're going to freeze the eye, how they're going to sterilize the eye, um, how they might or might not use a lid speculum, for example. So I was in a study that showed that the use of a lid speculum reduced the incidence of endophthalmitis, infection, the worst complication. So I'm a huge believer in putting a lid speculum in. There are other people that argue that putting this little speculum that forces the eyelids open could squeeze out some meibomian from the meibomian glands along the tear film and the edge of the eye, and maybe that produces some bacteria in there. So it just goes to show that, you know, it's not an entirely, entirely um, accepted step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step procedure, but there are certain steps that everybody is going to do and has to do to make it a safe injection. Um, and a follow-up to that, how common is it for someone to have serious side effects from the eye injections? Are there effects from the actual needle, or is it possible to also be sensitive to the medication that's being injected into the eye? Yeah, excellent question. So you can certainly get a uveitis or an inflammation from the medicine that was injected into your eye. So we saw that with brolocizumab, the rates of intraocular inflammation was too high afterwards. It was almost felt to be toxic, and so the drug has really fallen out of favor. When um, aflibercept first came out, or ILEA, there was some talk that it was maybe a bit more immunogenic in the eye, so causing a bit of inflammation. But in reality, any of the drugs that you put in the eye could cause a bit of an immune reaction. So we can see a purely sterile, non-infectious, uh, low level amount of inflammation in the eye after we stick a needle in it. There's just a trauma of going in the eye too. And so once we started seeing it in brolucizumab that there is some inflammation afterwards, I think we recognize that there can be inflammation just from the medication a little bit more than perhaps we thought. A lot of it is subclinical. The patient barely has any symptoms, so we don't really know about it. So that's that's fine. And if there's a bit of inflammation and you need a topical anti-inflammatory drop to suppress it, patients do very, very well. The most feared and dreaded complication is infection. Okay, so infection comes, and the source is not the medicine. Oh, good. There have been cases of contaminated Avastin. Yes, that's been documented. There has been knockoff of medications made in some countries where they've, they've they, they produced it, and it, not in a sterile technique. And yes, you're actually injecting the bugs into the eye with the medicine. But that is exceedingly rare. Basically, the infection comes from you putting the needle through the conjunctiva, there are bacteria in the conjunctiva, and you push it right into the eye. There is a concern that maybe the wounds leak sometimes, but I don't think so. Okay, so I don't think it's an after effect. It's at the time of injection. Typically, it takes about three days for that big bacteria colony to grow enough to give symptoms. The symptoms are decreased vision, pain, and redness. And so that's why if you have those symptoms after you get a needle in the eye, you have to come in and see it. The most common complication is just you hit a blood vessel on the surface of the conjunctiva, the thin covering of the side of the eye, and you get some bleeding. It turns red. It can look bad, but it doesn't cost any vision. It goes down, and typically there's relatively limited pain. And so nowadays, I get a patient to just take a picture of their eye because it saves them driving all all the way in to see me, and they email it to my secretary. I look at it, I'm like, yeah, that's just a subconscious hemorrhage, don't come in. And if it's more inflamed looking, then I'm like, get that patient in here uh, now. So what else could go wrong? Okay, so there's infection, we talked about it, detached retina. So there's the actual injection of the needle through the pars plana, but if you go through the retina, you could cause a hole. But also, the needle is going into the vitreous, the jelly-like substance that fills up the inside of the eye. And so you're going in and out through the vitreous. That in itself could move the vitreous. The vitreous attached to the retina. So you increase your risk of potential retinal tear in the periphery and therefore detachment. Hitting the lens, if you don't do it right, and there was a hole um, in one of the first trials that was done with Lucentis, the incidence of cataract was very high because we just hadn't developed technique and knowing where to aim the needle to miss the lens. But if you hit the lens, you're gonna give a wicked cataract uh, very, very quickly. Glaucoma. So that was brought up, somebody else mentioned it today. Really interesting point. So you're putting a volume of, uh, you're putting a substance into a closed sphere. So you have to increase the pressure as soon as it goes in. But the eye has good compensatory mechanisms to keep the pressure lower right away. There are some patients, though the pressure stays high in that post-injection period, and you have to actually sometimes stick another needle in to withdraw some aqueous and reduce the pressure. That should not, not be done commonly, because that's a second needle in the eye. It does open up an entrance wound to the anterior chamber, and I've seen cases of that leak and cause infection there. So this should never, never be done on a routine basis, but there are some times you have to lower the pressure acutely. Now there's the chronic glaucoma. So there has been some evidence that chronically getting injections into your eye varies something else. Maybe it is the silicone from the, the 
the needle that's going in or, or something else that's being introduced that impairs the trabecular meshwork outflow, how quickly fluid can get out of the eye. So there is an increased instance of glaucoma in the long term as well with serial injections, but not in everybody, for sure. It's still not a common thing, and it's very treatable typically with just drops. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Is there anyone in the room, or should I take an online? All right, we have one more on online question. Oh, we have one. Thank, thank you, Dr. Hurley. You, you mentioned uh, there has been some incidences with the use of the medication for geographic atrophy. And um, I wondered if you could expand on that. Yeah, so just like there's a side effect to sticking any needle in the eye, um, the new medication for dry macular degeneration, there are some patients who will have... Um, an undesired effect from it as well. And so people are really looking to see if it causes any inflammation. Um, I think we've been really attuned to this from our experiences, for example, with berlucizumab, which got approved, and only after it was approved did we find it had a higher incidence of serious inflammation. So the Government of Canada is taking its time to look at that. Uh, there's been a suggestion that you may have a higher likelihood of converting to wet macular degeneration when we are treating your geographic atrophy with this medication. But again, is it just now that these people are being so closely studied, right? They're in a clinical trial. Um, you mentioned you're in the trial, so you know you're, you're part of the family now. Because when you come in, you get really high resolution photographs taken and meticulous examinations every time you come in. So they're going to pick up on some of this stuff uh, more quickly, readily, um, that may have been happening anyway. And so that's why they're taking their time here in Canada to really vet um, the data um, before granting its approval and, and, and then eventually um, covering the cost of it. Thank you. I, I think we're at the end of our time. Um, so I just want to say a huge thank you to Dr. Hurley as well as, yes, absolutely. <laughs> as well as our wonderful three panelists, Claire, Heather, and Sheena. Thank you so much for sharing your time. Before I hand the mic back over to Michael, I do just want to do a bit of a shameless plug for our viewpoint resources over at fightingblindness.ca slash viewpoint. Um, you can keep up to date with all of our upcoming events as well. We have a huge resource library of past webinars for you to watch and enjoy. Um, we had so many questions come in online today, which is fantastic, but I'm sorry that we didn't get to all of them. If you do have questions about your eye health, uh, we encourage you to reach out to us at healthinfo at fightingblindness.ca, and we can help direct you to resources um, to help you be the best advocate for your vision health. Uh, so that brings our viewpoint to a close, but I'm going to pass the mic back to Michael, who will introduce our next special guest. And I think everybody got a really good idea about AMD. I'm going to be shameless too. Mohammed, you're going to put up. On your screen is the recent issue of White Cane Magazine. And if you want to use your QR codes and scan it, um, you'll be able to view a copy. And I think. Uh, um, it's very interesting. It covers many different facets of vision health care, vision care, and vision loss. And I um, hope you'll take an opportunity to uh, read it. Thank you. Bill C-284, an act to establish a national strategy for eye care. I think there's people in this room, I know there is, that as far back as 2003 were working on it. Uh, but it took a young lady from Humber Black Creek, Humber River Black Creek to get it through Parliament unanimously last October 25th, and we are now waiting for the Senate. As I said, she's the MP from Humber River Black Creek, Someone who has long demonstrated an unwavering commitment to public service, has served in various capacities at both the federal and municipal levels of government over the last 30 years. 
On June 14, 2022, she introduced the private member's bill. Last October, the bill was unanimously passed and is presently in the Senate. Once passed by the Senate, Bill 284 will have a direct and positive impact on Canadians' vision health now and for generations to come. Ladies and gentlemen, my friend, the Vision Health Community's Dynamo on Parliament Hill, the Honourable Judy Scrope. It doesn't seem like it's been a year, but it has been since I was here the last time. And we talked with such enthusiasm and hopes that C-284 was going to get the attention it needed and the votes it needed. And it was a full-time job focusing on that bill every single day. And we, I can't tell you how thrilled I was with the help that I got from everybody in the community. Michael, everything that the Canadian Council for the Blind, Fighting Blindness, our wonderful optometrist society, they all, you just connected me with everybody, overloaded me with all kinds of information uh, that I had to learn lots about, but the most important thing was we had to get the bill through the House of Commons. And at that time, I asked all of you to harass, be nice, talk to any MPs that you know, Go talk to them, tell them how important it is, because you've been waiting a long, long time. Somehow, in the government, we always deal with so many other issues. There's always other issues that are prioritized, right? And eye care and vision health has always somehow never been top of the pile. Well, now we got it finally on the top of the pile. We've got it through the House of Commons with unanimous consent. So there were 324 votes yes, and zero, no. So now, <laughs> which I wouldn't have been able to do without everybody's help. You know, because sometimes politics gets in the way of good things just because it's politics. And you know what? I'm a pretty non-political person, even though I've been in politics for a long time. Uh, talk to enough people at all levels of party made sure that they were included in the process and the discussion. And at the end of the day, I just had to endure a long process, but at the end of the day, we got it through. It's currently in the Senate. I don't have a lot of control over there. And I was told right off the bat, you've done your job, now we'll do ours. I said, okay, that's nice. Can you do it tomorrow? <laughs> right? Because I'm an impatient person and I live in a minority parliament and I always worry. I don't care what kind of deal we think we have with anybody. Things can collapse very fast. And I cannot see that anything happened to this. It's been just been too long that the community has been waiting for this to become a priority. So at 6 a.m. this morning, I was emailing a friendly senator asking him to contact the critic. The next step for this bill, it's had its first reading in, in the Senate. The next step is for the critic, which is Senator Victor O, in case you would like to reach out to anybody. His job now is to speak in the Senate in somehow as a critic, even though I'm told that everybody in the Senate loves it. The bigger challenge is they'd like to fix it and make it better, which means then it gets tossed back to the House and that would not be a good thing. So the whole idea to message is just approve it as it is because it is then subject to anywhere from 12 to 18 months of working with a variety of groups and people like yourselves to establish the framework for how the strategy is going to function. And that is in commitment with many of you in the room that would be consulted and worked through. So we don't need the Senate to uh, fix it or to make it any better. They can come to the committee and do that. For now, we just want them to say a great bill, stamp it, get it to the House for Royal Assent, and then it will become the law of the land. And then the real work comes. And that is, again, to work with all of you as to what should that framework look like? What's the best strategy for us to be able to 
sure that there's research money going into it and the kind of platforms that need to be established. So I'm, I'm optimistic. I'm still very pushy. Um, I called Senator Platt before I came over here because I was trying to see if I could get another answer as to when the critic was going to speak. And because uh, I can't get Senator Ove to return my phone calls. He knows what I'm calling for. Um, but anyway, Senator Platt, who's the head of the Conservatives in the Senate, uh, he said, Judy, I'm going into a meeting now. I'm going to find out if it's as big a priority as you think. He said, I think a lot of our people would like to see it through. So I said, well, please call me if it's not up on that priority list. And then, and then I have to figure out who I have to go to to get it on that priority list. While I have my phone, he hasn't called me. So I'm beginning to think that maybe I had a little bit more success again this morning. So, uh, But if any of you uh, have some time to send emails off to the Senate, just tell them about 284 and how important it is, uh, it would be very much appreciated. If you can't get it with one way, you do it another way. So as you all help to get it through the House of Commons, and Michael, uh, you and all of your community were just fabulous. And, and so now I just need you to help me get it through the finish line and then we'll have a massive celebration. Um, listening to the doctor speak earlier about AMD, of course February is AMD month. And it is amazing the people that I talk to that all have friends or family that are suffering with AMD. And so I think it's been something that needs to be talked about a whole lot more within our own communities and educated a lot more on one prevention and then the kind of treatment that is available now. There are a lot of new things happening out there in our world, uh, in Canada, United States, Australia, and so on, on vision care. So let's make sure that we've got the, we have the best knowledge that we possibly can have, and we do that by working together. So thank you very much for the invitation today. Please reach out to any senators you know. Even if you don't know them, you get their email address, Government of Canada Senate, just send them an email and ask them they please pass C-284 quickly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much.